Yes, welcome to Black Spaces and the Black Spaces Show. We give you sci-fi and fantasy from a Black SGL perspective. Many other shows will critique blockbuster and indie sci-fi and fantasy films and TV series, but we give you that unique critique about these sci-fi shows. This is Todd, and joining me is the uh, is a sister of Nubian Nebula royalty. <laughs> How was that? Was that pretty good? I like that. I like <laughs> okay, that. Okay, okay. Sister Toya, <laughs> Sister Toya. We are the sister and the brother from the mother planet. So how you doing, Sister Toya? I am doing good. Happy Sunday. Happy Sunday. Happy Sunday. And we are we are uh, having this uh, Black Spaces show um, prior to episode seven, but this is our mid-season review of Star Wars Andor. Uh, that's the show we're going to be discussing today uh, and since they have 12 episodes we said well let's let let's give a, a halfway uh or or a mid-season critique of what's going on so with with the black spaces show the thing we always do is we first give a little bit of context then we go into the question is it good sci-fi or is in this case is it good star wars sci-fi and then we give you that unique critique that you won't find anywhere else um you can catch us on the, the YouTube channel, and you can also catch us um, in our, you can, excuse me, you can catch us on our YouTube channel of Black Spaces, and then you can also catch us on our uh, Black Spaces website, which is www.blackspacesshow.com. That's www.blackspacesshow.com. Um, and please like, comment, and subscribe to keep Black Spaces alive. Uh, okay, now let's get into it. Just a little bit about the um, show. We don't give recaps, and 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 let me start start by saying spoiler alert, spoiler <laughs> alert. Sometimes I forget to do that. We don't give recaps. We give reactions, partly because there's so many other great shows out there that gives you a detailed recap. So we presume that you've seen what we've seen and can want to jump right into it. Um, but as you know, Andor, Star Wars, Andor is a spinoff from the uh, Star Wars Rogue One film, where Rogue One set up the premise right before the Star Wars episode of uh, four, A New Hope, uh, where you had the uh, um, uh, Urso, Jen Urso, as a, as a main heroic figure, along with who we're talking some about today, Cassian Andor, and, you know, they kind of lead a band and a military operation on the planet Scarif that will eventually steal the Death, uh, Death Star plans and convey it to the Rebel Alliance right before the Alliance uh, intercepts the Princess Leia's ship. Okay, but Andor is five years before then, and so uh, it sets up the premise of what's going on in, in the rebellion, in the budding rebellion, in, that we get to the point of discussing um, how did the rebellion come to be. Okay, that's enough non-recap. Okay, <laughs> so let's get into uh, a, a bit of a discussion here. And so we're midway through the season, Toya. Is this good sci-fi? You know, what, what's your view compared to what we've said earlier as to whether or not is it still, or is it good sci-fi? Is it good Star Wars sci-fi? What do you think? I think it is. I think it goes enough in detail that we understand the universe mm -hmm. that okay. we are putting ourselves into. We definitely see the big bad versus the oppressed little people as it would be. Um, you see that people are starting to chafe under the restraints of what the um, big bad is doing. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that you definitely feel engaged Okay. Um, I think that there's enough of the unusual that you know you're not in the proverbial Kansas anymore. Right. But it's still relatable. So right. I will say, yeah, that, and it definitely fits within the confines of the Star Wars universe that we've grown to know and love over the past forty some years. So I feel right. like it does do enough to keep the party going, or in a sense, get the party started. Because you're right, this is a prequel, um, to what we have traditionally seen as, even though it's seen as Episode Four. Right. The, the whole trajectory. That's right. The whole trajectory. Right. Right. And in some ways, 
Rogue One was a prequel to Episode Four, and this is a prequel to Rogue One. Um, right, right. I, I find it intriguing that they're doing a long runway approach, which is mm. I think is a good idea. I've heard some some fans and some some Star Wars commentators, um, and I, I listened to several of them, sort of say this is too darn slow. And I like, well, first of all, it's TV. Right, right. <laughs> so That's true. TV is not going to give it, you know, that if they tell the whole story in one episode, <laughs> good day. Mm -hmm. And secondly, TV television is a format for character development. And I know in some ways that and, and emotional and psychological development, which Star Wars um, has evolved in the broader canon to be about. But George Lucas... And those original films was sort of like, it was so fast paced, bang, 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 bang. You're like, okay, um, so so Ben Kenobi dies and, <laughs> and, 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 uh, and Luke, uh, uh, and Luke doesn't have a, uh, Luke Skywalker doesn't have a moment to shed a tear. They got to move. Right, right. <laughs> you know, they got to get the hell out of there. You know, so <laughs> it's sort of like, you know, or, you know, other deaths that, you know, Princess Leia loses her whole planet. She's like, huh? and then they move right. on. I'm like, <laughs> so so film doesn't permit, and particularly sort of space opera doesn't permit that level of emotional depth. But in this, I like this because you're seeing some things you haven't seen in Star Wars. They cuss in Star Wars Andor. That's true. That's true. We've gotten our first, someone took a wee-wee. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, what yeah. is that? What on Star Wars? And, you know, almost had sex or at least refer, you know, so it's sort of, as we said earlier, this is sort of mature, a, a little more mature, uh, I won't use the word adult, adult, but a more mature version of Star Wars, um, where you really are kind of getting into people, into the characters' heads. Mm -hmm. And so, like we'll talk about, you know, like the character Nimic, when Nimic is literally crushed as I've heard others commentators say, literally crushed by capitalism. Right, right. <laughs> the imperial capital, like, you know, the, the treasury that they steal, uh, the, the payroll they steal crushes him in the ship. Mm -hmm. You know, you like, well, Nimic was the Patrick Henry or or the, you know, Mandela or whatever. With, the, the, man the, with, with the manifesto. With the manifesto, right, right, right. So, and you know, and even that idea, I'm like, in all this time, there hadn't been a, a, a consideration in Star Wars that, Maybe there's a literary side to the rebellion too, not just you know the 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 military you know sort of uh, um, sort of popular aspect to it that people are writing and and mm -hmm. that writing and those you know that those those various narratives build toward why we must be free of this imperial right. yoke. Yeah, so so I find all that kind of fascinating, right? quite fascinating. Um, and there's no uh, mystery that again Tony Gilroy. Um, among among others uh, who are really more in the spy genre are sort of taking that that tax. Mm -hmm. Stephen Stephen Skiff, Tony Gilroy, all of them have been known in some respects for the aspects of spy, American spy, um, and sort of super agent and, and other sort of action uh, approaches. So so in in some ways, um, you can see it that a lot in in Andor. Yeah, mm -hmm. I agree. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, I, yeah, I agree. It's good, good, good sci-fi, and it's it's building on the Star Wars genre, I think, in in powerful ways, and and make making a more meaningful story because you care about mm -hmm. the characters. Okay, having said that, then um, let's get into uh, the unique critique, um, and we can we can come back around because there's other things you could talk about. I mean, maybe we'll leave leave this for a f critique further down the road in terms of plot and acting and dialogue, etc. But Let's get into unique critique. Um, I'm going to start with a critique that you provided about the the whole question. Um, and and folk who are on our channel know that we bring in um, black black literary genius. So we're going to bring in Paul Lawrence Dunbar to critique mm -hmm. <laughs> Star Wars and and Andor, um, and his his famous poem about we wear the mask. So the idea that that in order to foment a rebellion, you you cannot show your public face, you cannot show the mask. You have mm -hmm. to wear the mask. Or as was it Sam Greenlee who talked about the spook who sat by the door? Mm -hmm. Talk talk about that from your perspective. 
Toya, of the 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 way in which between Monmatha or Luthen, um, you know, or Kale or others that they're they're having to wear the mask in order to foment this rebellion and how that's intriguing. I think for me it's the fact that you have someone on the inside mm -hmm. making what happens happen. I mm -hmm. mean, you have the general that sort of guided the steps um leading up to the payroll heist right. because you have to have someone who can maneuver the soldiers mm -hmm. um to be at a certain location at a certain time right you know he had to walk that type rope type walk mm -hmm. walk that type rope right so that his higher ups didn't mm -hmm. suspect anything i love okay. the fact that when he was talking to one of his um lower soldiers like listen y'all need to clean this place up or right. else this right. is going to happen. So they're like, oh, oh, wait, wait. And he's like, well, you know, I mean, because he actually had them prompt him to say, well, why don't you let us go watch the start, you know, watch the one in occurrence. Okay. And then he's like, yeah, you're right. I don't want you to be here, but I had to make it so that right. it was your idea, you know? Right. So he had to sort of think four paces ahead, you know, okay. and then you have the person actually recruited Andor. Right to be that extra person. You mm -hmm. know, he looked totally different when he was out there parking his spaceship way far away to do the recruitment. Okay. And then the fact, I love the transformation when he came back, he literally put a new face in, or rather he put right. new hair in and new teeth <laughs> in. Yeah, Luthen, yeah. Uh -huh. Right, just totally shaped himself so he looked totally different. Right. You know, and mm -hmm. the fact that even when the sender came to buy something and then it had to go into the back room and how nervous he was right. for the days leading up to it because I think it is you have to have someone that's willing to lift the mantle and, and fight the fight but you have to have someone to grease the wheel right. right? you have to have someone to literally leave the door open for you to bust in and to break up the hierarchy you know and so right. I, I love the fact that this is allowing us to see because all before we've seen the scrappy little fighters. That's right. No, we need people that have power positions, people who know people, mm -hmm. people who can make it happen so that you can hijack the freighter and you can steal the payroll. Because like with all things, rebellions take money. Right. Rebellions take resources. And I love the fact that we're seeing how those resources are being allocated from people that are literally doing the Robin Hood thing, stealing from the rich to give to the poor. Right, right. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I think your reference to to um, Lieutenant Gore. We're, we're going to talk about him in a minute. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, your 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 broader reference to you know what's going on with the the, the dynamics of fomenting a rebellion. I, you know, I did do my little uh, sort of tongue in cheek video about what do you mean. The, the empire has these these stacks of currency that focus. They ain't got Venmo or Cash App. <laughs> right. And I got I like nobody's catching that. In like in, in this day and age, in you this would day think and age, we I have mean, Cash apps. So yeah, can't y'all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We got Cash App. I mean, why not long uh, long ago in the galaxy far away? I mean, come on. <laughs> It's like, well, no, let's just put 500 million uh, imperial credits in this room, this vault over here, and nothing could possibly go wrong. So, right. <laughs> it's like, and it's weighted at that. It's not even light paper. We're talking about metal. Oh, okay? yeah. Oh, huge, yeah, huge, huge chunks of, 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 of credits. I'm like, wow. And, you know, but I guess, I guess that is. So that's for that's for you know plot development, right? Because if it was all about oh somebody sat down at a computer terminal, do 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 do, okay transfer, <laughs> right. you know well what's the what's the you know there right. there is no uh, peril in that, so mm -hmm. so it it makes it more fun and you know more perilous, more dangerous, etc. It it feels feels more like a spy mystery, mm -hmm. of the great the great breaking into the vault you know story, right. but yeah yeah yeah. But you're you're right. This sort of this whole idea of having to to um, to be secretive, you know, that Mon Mothma must be secretive even to her family, right, to mm -hmm. her husband and her child, um, who I'm particularly sympathetic to what she does as a senator, anyway. <laughs> no, they're not, or, or her or her or her budding worldview, um, right. and that Luthen is sort of is kind of intriguing because when he gets the news that the heist has succeeded. He's elated, but mm -hmm. he hasn't yet heard of the enormous cost, right? True. And so to, to me, it's it's also sort of showing that 
Uh, like, and you know, it just shows that revolutions require sacrifices, right? Mm. And so, um, you know, you're talking about you're talking about freedom at the point of violent rebellion, mm. um, and that folk can have to make some problematic and sometimes morally dubious choices. You know, I mean. Andor is quick with a gun. If he's right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> if 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 he thinks you out of line, then like when Skeen came back and said, "Let's split right. it, and get the rest right. of them." Pow! With a quickness. <laughs> with a quickness, took him out. <laughs> it's like, could he have been playing you? No, let's not even let let's not even uh, mm -hmm. and, uh you know uh um risk that. Pow! <laughs> well, I know that's not what blaster said. I mean, but anyway. still, <laughs> yeah, took him out with a quickness. So yeah, I, I agree that that whole. You know, as, as as intrinsic to um the genre of of of, of spy spy mysteries, uh it it, it kind of correlates with that that broader theme of sort of sitting by the door. Now, mm -hmm. getting next to that sitting by the door, let's talk about Lieutenant Gorn because up to this point he's the most prominent uh, African American character. Mm -hmm. uh, although Venta, you know, is um you know I, I I'm presuming I'm, I'm making presumptions, but is she is a woman of color or conceivably a South Asian woman. So um, what do you kind of think of his characterization of, you know, he's a lieutenant, so he's high enough to be commanding significant numbers of troops in this garrison, but he's not the commandant. He's right. not the ones who are literally, you know, the, the, the you know, the folk who, who, who are sitting back watching the operation, you know, kind of obviously being happy and comfortable because they can't even, their belts aren't even fitting anymore when they right. put on the dress mm -hmm. <laughs> So, so, but what do you think of his characterization in, 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 in this particular story? I mean, I like the fact that you got a sense that he has been the person that doing the grunt work. Like you're okay. saying, he has direct reports, but he also reports to someone else. And he's the one that knows the ins and out. He, has the relationships with the people. And so it's just like, he probably would have been the best resource to sort of, if the shoes on the other foot to know what was going on, because he's in a position to hear the rumors. Mm -hmm. He's in a position to know. And I think it's just the, the testimony that too many times people of color are in these positions of say middle management where they know what is going on the top and the bottom and no one's willing to listen to them. Right. You know, and I think the fact that he probably was a company man, you right. know, you would right. assume that if he's been in the trenches for enough time that he has received this position that he is on this outpost doing this, and he obviously had been there for a while, mm -hmm. that he's had a chance to see something, right. you know, and it's right. like a, you can take and take and take until you can't take no more. That's right. And then it's just like when you realize I've given myself to this organization. Mm -hmm. and I'm not getting anything from it. Not only am I not benefiting from it, mm -hmm. when I actually attempted to reach beyond and to have a life outside of this with his relationship with That's the right. Native woman, right. that gets snuffed out. And then to add insult and injury, you know, this was someone I care for, and yet you're going to sell her whole culture That's when right. the pilgrims come. You That's know, right. you're making disparaging remarks, and I get the sense of, you know that if you were not in the room, the same type of comments they're saying about these pilgrims is probably what they say about your family, uh -huh. about your people, you right. know? So right. I like the fact that we had the chance to see him meet the rebels and also the chance where they're in the garrison and he is revealed to be the one that actually helped orchestrate all this. Right. And then the commandants look on his face like, what? At you, Brute? You too? <laughs> and he was like, I can show you better than I can tell you. That's you right. Know, that's right. That's right. And you know, step lively with this gun behind your back. <laughs> right. Right. That that line, and I'm I'm paraphrasing, but that line where the commandant says, "You know, you're hang for this," and and Gore's right. response was, "I should get receive worse serving under right. you for seven years." Exactly. exactly. <laughs> so so yeah, that that yeah, I I find it intriguing. I said this in an, another sort of um, YouTube short commentary about Gorn's character as a black man as and collaborator that he's sort of mm -hmm. using his sympathies for for the oppressed um mm -hmm. and in this case you know he quote unquote went native in the sense that he right. had this love relationship with this Aldani woman the same people who the galactic empire are trying to 
uh, essentially eradicate, get, mm -hmm. get rid of the folk so they can have this enormous base on, on this planet. And so, um, you know, and, it, and, and of course, it's also interesting, we'll get into that a little bit, but how they actually portray the Aldani, you know, uh, in terms of the clothing that they wear, mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're shepherds, they, you know, it could mm -hmm. be the Peruvian Andes, it could be, mm -hmm. you know, sort of several other places um, where, where you got um, sort of um, folk in, in that sort of style of, of, of dress. But, um, but yeah, the, I find it intriguing that he, that he is cast in this role um, as, you know, as a, as, as we would say in the 21st century, a, a black man who's a black man from a distance like myself, and um and but those roles have been similar they, they they parallel other instances in science fiction when science fiction is trying to make a point about oppression mm -hmm. and so i i bring up in a yet another commentary about the the figure of mcdonald in the planet of the apes who conspired with the apes and caesar and the apes in order to help ferment their their uh, rebellion um, McDonald's a little conflicted, but he but he sympathizes. He sees that the apes and and and, and sees this being oppressed, and Gorn sees the Aldani are being oppressed. So right. to me, that sympathetic black figure is sort of intriguing in sci-fi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, now let's let's move on to the relationship that is the first of its kind we have seen in Star Wars, mm -hmm. which is a same gender loving relationship, as far as we can tell, between the 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 rebel team leader, Kel and Venta. We, we get all these hints that they have an intimate relationship. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that Skeen initially tells Andor when he's looking over at Venta, she's already sharing her blanket with someone else. And you right, see right, her kind right, of, right. you know, near, you see her near Kel. And then mm -hmm. at the end, you know, throughout there were signals, but then at, particularly at the end, there's a really poignant moment that feels like a romantic goodbye mm -hmm. <laughs> between mm -hmm. Kel and Venta. So um, is, is this some indication that Star Wars is, 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 you know, for all the ways in which people say it's not about you know, um, it reflecting the greater society. Is this some way in which Star Wars is reflecting the fact that same gender loving relationships, you know, that, you know, we're here and we, mm -hmm. we exist. Um, why not in Star Wars? What, what's your, what's your mm -hmm. thoughts? Go ahead. I mean, I agree. I think it was high time for Star Wars to catch up with what everybody else was doing. Mm -hmm. um, I like the way that it was sort of hinted at and accepted by everyone in the camp. Okay. I mean, Venta was a healer. Um, but Venta didn't take no wooden nickels, you know, <laughs> and she was the one that I'm going to heal you, but don't take my kindness for weakness. I can shank you as well. Right. You know, and I like the fact that when it came down to it, it was those two that really had the most important role because right. they had to right. start the motion as far as jamming the communication. That's right. And she was left behind to make sure the hostage didn't get aligned. And it was that tender goodbye because you had the understanding that she was going to be left behind and she would have to find a way for them to be reunited. Right. And the likelihood is that it would not be an easy reunion if it right. happened at all. Because right. you get a sense of it probably didn't happen. That's right. You know, because there was no way of them knowing where they would land, particularly when the, you know, troops are on their trying to escape into mm -hmm. that brilliant display of light. And right. so I think it was a good reflection of that if we can have all these diverse life forms mm -hmm. in this galaxy far, far away, that you can have relationships right. where it's not the strict heteronormative man, well, male identified person, right. female identified person. If you can have two women unite in the struggle, that is not falling all over each other to the detriment of the revolution. You know, even when they love each other and care for each other and support each other, they realize what their goal is, and that is to overthrow this establishment. And sometimes okay. you, you know, to the point you have to make sacrifices. Let me ask you, Toya, and 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 unpack this for me, if you will, about um in from your perspective. And you are a wise commentator on this. Do you do you feel that audiences is there a gendered aspect to the portrayal of same gender loving relationships when it's women versus cisgendered women? Let's be 
let's be clear, cisgender women versus cisgender men. Do you think that, um, you, you know, to me, there's the, I'll, I'll just say this real quick. Right? To me, there's the, there's sort of a, a, a bit of a subtle and powerful feminist critique that's mm. provided here, a feminist lens that's provided here, that the, the critical functions were provided by the sacrifices of women who, mm -hmm. who, who love women. But then also, mm -hmm. is there is it you know I don't you, you don't you don't have to climb in the minds of the Disney executives or <laughs> but this is also it's like well it would be a softer critique if it was two women versus two men. So right. what do you think of those politics of this portrayal in science fiction and in Star Wars in particular? <laughs> I mean, I, I totally agree. I think it's more palatable that okay. you see the two women hmm. where they were the one that really pulled it together. I right. think when you look at the crew, they were the one that were most capable. But then you're right, they're the ones that sacrifice. That's right. You know, and I think it is easier to digest. Okay. Um, I think hmm. it was easier to draw the characters hmm. without making distinction. I think if it had been uh, two men, I think that unfortunately it had to be more of a distinction where one would have to be quote, quote, more capable, you know what I'm saying, <laughs> I'm more capable than the other one. I mean, right. I think uh, by having two women, uh. they both can be capable. They both can be, right. you know, even Venture was a healer, right. she knew her way around a weapon as well. Oh, you know? clearly, clearly. Yeah. Right, but, but both women did, you know. Right. And I think it was that even when there was acceptance of Andor and they were trying to figure out who was this man and where is he coming from, you know, they respected that she was a leader, mm -hmm. what she said went, Right. And don't ask too many questions. Right, right, right. Yeah, and, and to me, it is intri intriguing. Other than Nimic, it's either a, you know, a man of color, mm -hmm. Lieutenant Gord, or a, or women, mm -hmm. Vale Inventor, or women of color, mm -hmm. <laughs> who, who, who make these key sacrifices at time. Now, that's not to discount that Andor was key in getting them, you know, through the clouds. Yeah. Right, yeah I mean, right. I think it's even intriguing that that um that Diego Luna, you know, as a, a Mexican American man, mm -hmm. Chicano, um, is is you hear his name his accent, his 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 Spanish accent coming clearly coming through. Mm -hmm. So it's not Diego Luna playing playing, you know, Andor with no accent. Mm -hmm. It is he's evoking something other than European American. Sure. In, in in use of that accent, you know, and again, we talked earlier in the earlier episode about uh, of, the, of this show about, um, you know, sort of uh, humans with darker features. So there's mm -hmm. all these cues. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, Luna is also an executive producer. So that mm -hmm. might also have some bearing as to why we're seeing all of these interesting race and gender cues. In exactly. Um, and there's also some class ones. I, I heard someone do a Marxist analysis of the show <laughs> about, you know, capitalism and literally cr crushing uh, again, Nimit. Right. Um, but yeah, there's all these interesting cues going on. But but circling back around to gender, yeah, I, I, I'm I'm intrigued by that because on one side, I don't want to deflect from the interesting sort of feminist critique or feminist lens of the of the power of these women. Mm -hmm. But then I also know that the sort of the the if I can just state it plain, the sort of some of the homophobia and masculinist mm -hmm. notions of the broader society say, oh, well, okay, we can accept two women, but two men, you know. Oh yeah. And, you know, and I think we're even a little different there, but still, I think I'm not surprised that Disney took this choice. If we're gonna have a same gender loving relationship mm -hmm. as the first one in Star Wars, let's do this versus mm -hmm. that. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Last thing I'll kind of bring up is sort of the broader question of the role of the galactic empire and what's being revealed in this series which we know is sort of um this has always been in in both in the the broader star wars universe in the in the uh in the uh, lore, uh, legends or lore there's been stories about the 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 scope and what the intent of the galactic empire and what it did in order to 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 oppress to colonize other planets um, but this is the first time in live action Star Wars canon that you kind of really get the sense of, okay, the Prelox Corporation is similar to the British East India Company of the British Empire. And the clearly the, the, um, the empire toward the Aldani people is just like the, empire, the British Empire 
relative to Native Americans in, in North America or, or take your pick, British Empire anywhere. Right, right. <laughs> that, that, you know, that wasn't part of Britain, you know. Uh, well, quite frankly, uh, it's interesting. It's, it was filmed in Scotland because the Scottish who also have a view of the British. Oh, yes, they do. <laughs> so, you know, not to mention Nor Northern Ireland. So what do you, what's this interesting lens? Do you think we can kind of even get away from, from seeing that now nah, this seems analogous to other parts of imperial history of a history of oppressing people? It's kind of, you know, it's kind of hard to, you know, to, to, to get away and not say, oh, this is just about a wonderful space opera. Cause it seems right. like they've got some pointed critiques of oppression and in, in what's going on. I totally agree. I mean, the whole sense of the colony and the empire. Right. You know, the coming in, you know, walking the streets, right. trying to take all the resources. That's right. Um, I think when we have this instance with the pilgrims and they're being very disrespectful right. of their ways and their ways of paying tribute, you know, and just really maximizing a natural occurrence as very relevant and very spiritual mm -hmm. for the people as just something to be entertainment. Right. You know, I, I do think that this is, you know, and, you know, God bless her memory, the fact that with the recent death of Queen Elizabeth II, now mm -hmm. we're looking back at the fact that these colonies are not going to take what y'all been doing laying down. Okay. You know, the seeds have been fermenting and now the sprouts are popping up. Right. And this is just really not being heavy handed, but being clear enough that you can see the comparison. Right. You know, the fact that the rebels are organizing and have reason to organize. Right. Um, because the time has long since passed and we're just going to take whatever y'all dishing out. So mm -hmm. I do see the comparison. Right. And, and it's also showing the breadth and scale of the resistance that was bubbling mm -hmm. under uh, when they were b back on Ferrix, <clears throat> when the the pre locked corporation security guards were coming and everyone was banging on metal as right. as, as, as to, to signify, which is right. you know you can take a whole bunch of examples in human history about you know they're coming, <laughs> they're coming, prepare yourself, you know put put away things because they're coming for us, um, which, which which sort of shows that there was a, a, a broader resistance among the people as to not only the empire, but the, but the minions of the empire, that the Prelax Corporation, eventually mm -hmm. they're, they're, you know, they're supplanted, you know, the Security Bureau comes through, Imperial Security Bureau comes through and says, hey, you're not oppressing them well enough and, and, right. and prices are down, your charter's revoked, we're gonna come in and do it ourselves. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. which, which is essentially, <clears throat> again, um, a, a, a not too subtle critique about, you know, if, if you do not, if you do, if you things get out of hand, we can revoke your, your royal chart. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. <laughs> we we can come and do it ourselves. It. Right. So, yeah, I, I think it is intriguing. It's kind of, you know, I, I, I know I'm answering my own question and saying it the way I said it, but I think it's, it's hard not to read this sometimes as a little bit of social science fiction. What mm -hmm. what do we take Ooh, from I it? Like that. You know that we see as part of the broader milieu, and I, you know, and I'm lo I love the good storytelling and the special effects and the music and and the and the great. I love all those things, but I'm like, ultimately, it entertains us, but makes us think. Well, how how is this relevant to the galaxy we live in? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. Mm -hmm. So to to me to me that's sort of some of the powerful stuff that's going on there. Definitely, I agree. Yep, yep. Okay, any anything else, Toyo? What do you you see anything on the horizon? Anything curious? I mean, we'll see episode seven very shortly after right. we air this, uh, you know, episode. I'm I'm sure we're going to return to the Senate. We're going to see some other things going on. But what, mm -hmm. anything you're kind of waiting to see? Um, you know, relative to what we know thus far with these first six episodes? I mean, I'm looking to see how, what is going to happen after the payroll heist. Yep. I'm looking to see how that trickles down, you mm -hmm. know, because I can definitely see it's going to be an impact on the micro and the micro, yes. macro and micro, right. you know, and how, as word spreads, what is this going to mean for other acts of rebellion? Right. Maybe not to a point of, knocking over a payroll 
but that minuscule, you know, little a trickle breaks the rock down. You know, it only right. takes a little trickle of water right. to crumble a rock. That's you know, right. so I'm excited about it. I I am too. I think. Uh, they're giving you the impression that Andor is going on his merry way, but he's not. Mm. <laughs> he's going to get pulled back in in some way, shape, or form, of course. Mm -hmm. um, and probably Luthen or someone right. will say, you know, okay. Um, and I think the, the the manifesto he got from Nimick, Definitely. I think that's going to change his mind. You know, I think he's going to begin to read that, you know, mm -hmm. like the like the autobiography of Malcolm X helped open, yep. open the world for me. Uh, yeah. reading a, that manifesto is going to kind of pull him in. Because um, I think at heart, the reason why he he shot Skeen was like, listen, I'm, I might be a scoundrel, but, I, but I'm not a thief. Right, so exactly. I'm not, I, exactly. I was paid to do a job. I'm not going to steal, you know, that money. Um, and so, you know, um, you know, uh, he, he, he did what he did. He got rid of him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, yeah, there. Yeah, and, and they, I think the the other aspect, and I suspect we may see it in seven. We may not. Is Saul Guerrero? Mm -hmm. Saul they Guerrero. mentioned him already. They have mentioned him already. Yeah, quite significantly in the trailers, right? And him and mm -hmm. he and Luthen have a conversation some point in the series, but some mm -hmm. some point in this series. I want to disabuse folks of the notion <laughs> that Saul Guerrero is just this blind blind terrorist. Because we are now seeing that everyone had some blood on their hands in the revolution. Right. Okay. Saul, I think, was just being honest. Now, he made some things that sapped some things from his soul because mm. of the plan of what was done to his planet, the death of his sister. So mm. everyone's operating through some pain. Andor is looking for his sister. Everyone mm. is operating through some pain. Mon Moth is about to lose her family, as far as we can tell. Right. So to me, I, I, I mean, I know that folk use the word terrorist and they might mean different things, but I think he is just, ha he happens to be what I call not a terrorist. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe he used some terrorism, but he's a radical flank. Right. He's that side of the rebellion that says, if you don't deal with the more reasonable side, <laughs> you got to deal with me. So, right. exactly. so, so anyway, I think, I, you know, I, and that, that's been a function, as I've said in another episode, um, I'll link all these to this video. You know, that's been a function of Black Revolution overall. It's mm -hmm. like Malcolm I X to Martin Luther King. So, yeah, I'm, I'm intrigued right, right. to see what's, where Saul's going to come in. Yep, yep. Okay. All right. We won't do a rating, uh, Toya, because we'll we'll wait. We'll, we'll, we'll give you a opportunity and me an opportunity and our other commentators an opportunity to see mm -hmm. it all the way through. Uh, but, yeah, I agree. I think, I think it's uh, been uh, a really good um, show up to this point. And we got some other things that we're going to keep on tap. Uh, of course, folks, we well, everyone knows that Black Panther is coming. And so mm -hmm. you can expect that Black Space is going to have something to say. Oh, of course. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Toya's going to organize that the, the uh, white party in her city. I'm going to organize it in mine. <laughs> We're going to walk in, walk in the Black Panther with our white on at whatever point. Yeah. Um, as I, I think, have I already said this about Black Panther uh, in another episode? I heard someone make a joke about uh, you know, a poignant joke about Black Panther is like mm -hmm. that this movie is going to represent um, a, a sense of mourning for Black folk given Chadwick Boseman's death. Mm -hmm. And you're going to have to have chaplains in the lobby. Right. <laughs> you're going to have to have ladies in white for real. With ladies faith. in white. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll have the stu stewards attending to the communion right. rail and to, and to the, and mm -hmm. the ushers, uh, you know, with people exactly. with some smelling sauce. Because yes. uh, the church fans. Gotta yeah, have church, church fans. fans. The folks going to be slayed in the spirit. Yes, going to be laid out. <laughs> laid out <laughs> for Black Panther. Yes. So, so we're going we're, we're gonna to have some great commentary for Black Panther. And there's other things coming. The Foundation series is coming at the end. The Star Trek Discovery. Mm -hmm. um, what what else? Oh, Picard is coming back for another oh, yeah. season. So there's a lot of great sci-fi coming up. And you can expect that Black Spaces is going to comment as, on as much of it as we can. So yeah. tune in to Black Spaces. You can, you can catch us again on our YouTube channel. Um, our, we have a Facebook page if you want to connect to us. Um, it's Black Spaces. You can connect to us and we'll, we'll invite you into there. We likewise uh, have a website, www.blackspacesshow.com uh, um, and Gmail, email. Uh, if you want to send comment or commentary, uh, that is uh, uh, blackspacesshow2001 at gmail.com, space odyssey 2001. And uh, 
And of course, again, you can catch us here uh, regularly, twice a week, um, on on this YouTube channel. Uh, so as we say in uh, in uh, our Black Spaces space, we want you to please like, comment, and subscribe in order to do what, my sister? Make Black Spaces thrive. To make Black Spaces thrive. All right, thank you very much, Toya. Thank, thank you folks for joining us. Have a good one. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.